Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. So when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. Then he added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here ends the reading of this holy word. So this week in the church is the Sunday where we recognize Human Relations Sunday. And in our denomination, this is a day when we acknowledge the work that people have done towards uh, reconciliation among different groups of people. And in our scripture for today, we find a great example of what it means to have prejudice against somebody. In what I truly believe is one of the funniest moments in the Bible, and yes, there are funny moments in the Bible, we find the calling of Philip and Nathaniel to follow Jesus. And when Philip is called, he believes and he is ready to go. But when he goes to tell his friend Nathaniel about Jesus, we get the funny line here of, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right, so let's explain that just a bit in case, in case you don't know. Jesus had grown up in the city of Nazareth. That's why he was referred to as Jesus of Nazareth. It's a common way to explain who someone was. So if we were to take this into modern terms, I would be Eric of Guthrie. The phrase, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth, was actually a common little joke for people of this time period. Uh, it was a joke because Nazareth was considered to be one of the least significant places in the entire kingdom. It is what we would think of today as a backward little town, right? So when Philip tells Nathaniel that they found the Messiah, and guess what? He's from Nazareth. Nathaniel lets his prejudice show towards the people of Nazareth. Now when he meets Jesus... Nathaniel has a different tone entirely. Jesus tells him that he already knows him. I saw you sitting under the fig tree. And Nathaniel responds with, you are the king of Israel, the son of God. What a turnaround, huh? In a short period of time, going from, oh, nothing good comes out of that place. Come on, tell me another one, Philip, to truly you are the son of God. And now for me, the joke is this. You know, they say, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, the best thing that has ever been came out of Nazareth. So yes, something good can come out of Nazareth. You know, when you think about our world today, I often don't find it to be very different from the world back then in a lot of ways. You know, here and now you might say something like, can anything good come out of the third ward? Can anything good come out of Shemokin? Now, if you're from Shemokin, you know what you say? Can anything good come out of Sunbury? Right? You know, it's all about this uh, perspective of what you think is a good place and a bad place. Where I grew up, it would be, could anything good actually come out of Arkansas? 
I, I know you thought I was going to say Texas there because that's usually the thing. But no, in Oklahoma, we look down on Arkansas. And guess what? They look down on us. So you see, it's a matter of perspective when it comes to the place that you think is bad and the place that you think is good. And the truth is there is a lot of good things and a lot of good people that come out of those places that you think aren't all that good. The problem with thinking that a group of people that share a common characteristic are all the same is what leads to our issues of prejudice in our world today. It is a very simple way of thinking and one that is almost always destroyed the more you get to know a person from that particular group. I want to tell you a story this morning of a man named Daryl Davis. Now, maybe you have heard of Daryl Davis. Maybe you haven't. Uh, Daryl is an African-American uh, blues mu musician by trade. He's a piano player. And he travels around the United States playing his music. And he has a very interesting hobby that he pursues as he travels around the United States. And his hobby is... He seeks out members of the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, you heard that right. An African-American blues musician spends his free time seeking out members of a white supremacist hate group. Now, I've heard of some risky hobbies. But for me, this is, uh, sounds like you like to go skydiving with an alligator strapped to your chest. So you can wrestle him on the way down. It seems like it would be that sort of a dangerous hobby, right? In his time seeking out these people, Daryl has developed many relationships with these other men. And he has had over 200 people decide to quit the KKK because of his involvement getting to know them. He has turned 200 people's lives around. Can you imagine one man helping 200 people to leave a life of hate simply because he was brave enough to go and talk to them? Now, what I find most amazing about this is Mr. Davis says he didn't set out to get these people to leave the KKK. That's not why he started doing this. He just wanted them to answer a question for him. And the question he had for them is, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? From just asking them that question and getting able to know them and show them that their hatred for a whole group of people was founded on false ideas, he was able to help so many people. With that approach, he was able to get people to listen to someone that they normally would have never chosen to speak with. Now, when we think about prejudice in our world and we think about it in our own lives, it might not affect you at all. At least you believe that it may not affect you all at all. Uh, you know, maybe you sit there this morning and you can say, hey, pastor, I don't hate anyone. I don't believe anyone deserves to be judged by the color of their skin or where they come from, or the social class that they were born into. You know, I hope that that is true for you. Only you and God know what is truly in your heart when it comes to these things. And by and large, I do not believe that we have a problem with that here in our church. Yes, we may look around and we don't see a lot of diversity, but I do believe we live at our mantra that all are welcome here. But... I have to say, I do believe that there is one group that the church today struggles to accept. And ironically, we all happen to be a part of that group. So I want, you, I want to ask you this question. Do you feel the same way about sinners as you do other groups of people? Do you look at sinners and say, hey, I don't hate them because of the mistakes they've made, and I don't judge them for their failings? Now, I hope that is the case, but in truth, it doesn't always play out in our world that way. 
See, one of the great problems that I believe is facing the church today, and I don't mean this church, I mean the church globally, is that Christians have decided that they should judge and separate themselves from sinners. We spend a lot of times as Christians yelling about how this world is going downhill because of the way people are sinning. Well, brothers and sisters, I have to ask you, what good does it do? What good does it do to yell at others about their sins? Has it ever stopped someone from sinning? Has it ever helped them come to know Jesus? You might think to yourself, oh yeah, sure it does. I yelled at this guy because he was a sinner and he turned his life around. Well, I honestly would have to argue that that person probably just got better at hiding their sin from you. See, what we need if we want to make a difference in this world and help people to have a new life that is born again in Jesus is to start acting like Jesus. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus did not spend his time on this earth going to holy people. He didn't spend his time looking at others and saying, wow, look at that guy. What a sinner. Whew, that guy, I'm glad I don't have the same sin in my heart that he does. He didn't spend his time looking up to God, his father, and saying, look, father, look how good I am compared to that person. I know you'll bless me because I am better. No. He went to those sinners and he tried to help them. He went to them and he showed them how their sin was destroying their lives and their chance at eternal life. He spent his time with those that even today we would look down upon, right? The religious leaders of his time would say, why does he spend all his time speaking with prostitutes, tax collectors, and drunkards? Well, if you were to think of three groups that in modern times are often looked down upon, I'd have to argue prostitutes, tax collectors, and drunkards would fall into those three groups. But Jesus spent his time going to them. And when the religious leaders of his day charged him with being one of them because he spent his time with them, he responded to them in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, by saying, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus didn't separate himself from sinners. He went right to them. So are we doing the same? Now, I'm not telling you, and I'm not saying that we need to sin ourselves. And I'm not saying that sin is not a problem, because it is. Do not misunderstand me here. What I'm saying is that though sin is a problem, we should not spend our time focusing on the sins of others and shaming them for their mistakes. What we should be doing is helping them to find a life in Jesus so that they can be free from those sins. Well, how do we do this? How, how can we possibly do something like this? Well, I think we take a good example from Mr. Davis from earlier. We get to know them. We talk with them. We find out why they might be doing the things that they are doing. We help them learn of a better way of living that is found in following Jesus. We help them to come to a new life and leave the old one behind. And we don't do this because we hate their sin. We do this because we love them the same way that Jesus loved us. So let us not turn our backs on our brothers and sisters because of their sin but let us help them to come and know the one that can take those sins away. My challenge for you this week is this. I want you to talk to one person this week that you normally don't. And it doesn't have to be about God. If it is, that's even better. But just talk to one person you don't normally talk to this week and begin a new relationship with them and then see where it leads. Amen.